Hello, hello. I am Josef. Um, let me speak um, or provide you maybe a researcher perspective on a specific component of wash sanitation. Uh, Honza works in practice and uh, we as researchers should somehow address practical needs, but we also want to understand the phenomena as such. So academic or research approach is a bit different. Um, but um, before I, before the start of my presentation, let me return to your question. This is, in fact, very interesting uh, and to some extent philosophical question uh, between the conflicts, about the conflicts between human rights and capability to achieve these rights. Uh, so I think that theory can help to somehow answer this question. There is a right-based approach and um, these resolutions about uh, human rights, including human rights to water and sanitation, is a um, normative view. So we know, and it's recognized internationally, that there is some universal rights, like rights to water, but there is a capability approach, uh, which argues that rights is, is such is not enough, so there are states and governments as duty bearers and there are markets that can also help sometimes help sometimes work against uh, achieving this capability so people should be capable to pay for water if they are not capable if it's not affordable states as duty bearers should help them to achieve these rights so this is the like not conflict i agree with Jan that it's not a conflict but possible conflict can be there, of course. Sometimes market-based approaches and markets can work, can work against uh, providing enough capabilities for people to be able to meet their rights and needs. Yeah, so theoretical theories can provide some answers to these philosophical questions, I think. Sanitation, sanitation in the global south. Uh, I am from the Faculty of Science, Charles University, and my background is geography. Geography is divided into, um, you may be familiar with this, physical geographer and human geography. I am human geographer. It means that my focus is on interactions between individual behavior, social dynamics, and environment. Human environment, society, society, social, social interactions is the core focus of our research, and I think that sanitation, and WASH in general is a perfect example of these interactions because uh, social dynamics, social behavior, and individual behavior is an important aspect, uh, as well as the environmental factors are very important for this phenomena. Very simple outline for this presentation. I will, work, I will speak about some, let's say, basic introduction and global context, including, including again, some figures, data, um, which uh, should demonstrate the importance of sanitation. And then I will step by step provide a few examples um, from our research. We do research in mainly in two primary research, mainly in two countries. India is my main country of interest, and Ethiopia, also in relation to the work of uh, people in need, is, uh, let's say, secondary country of my interest. In addition to primary research, we also do some research based on secondary data, like systematic reviews and uh, statistical analysis of secondary data. Uh, the, Examples which I'm going to provide you will be not exhaustive. More recently, we work on some new topics. So this uh, presentation was prepared uh, not particularly for this purpose, but it's a bit dated. So apologies for, for this. And I should make clear that our focus is not, in individual, not on individual projects. I know that the title of this uh, seminar or event is Wash in Project but for my research, and I think that it uh, holds for academic research more generally, the main level is program and policy level. Of course, it's interrelated because projects usually uh, have been implemented within larger programs, 
and programs are designed within policies, but uh, the ambitions and potential of research is more towards this higher level um, practical, impl practical implications, program levels. Global context and illustration of the importance of WASH. First slide is about WASH in general. So to support Honza's figures, uh, I can provide some estimates from a regularly published uh, global burden of disease study, which uh, attempts to estimate the mortality related uh, causes of that and uh, for WASH, the estimate is that 1.4 million of preventable deaths annually are related to inadequate WASH conditions, water sanitation and hygiene together, all these three domains. It means about 2.5% of all preventable deaths globally, so it's a major, still it's a major cause of mortality, global mortality, uh, particularly for children. Children generally and particularly very small children are the most vulnerable group. Uh, it also reflects data. Uh, here, 13% of global mortality in the category of kids below five is attributable to inadequate wash conditions. Again, preventable mortality. These deaths could have been prevented if uh, conditions around water, sanitation, and hygiene would be better. Uh, the most important part of these deaths and burden of disease uh, is attributable to diarrhea, diarrheal diseases. This group of diseases related to diarrheal, diarrheal infections. Of course, there are some other diseases like uh, respiratory infections that are also um, caused or related to inadequate wash conditions, but the number one is diarrhea. Uh, Wash-related mortality accounts for a major, major part of <coughs> diarrhea-related uh, diseases. Health impacts is, uh, are usually uh, the number one reason why to focus on WASH, but there are also significant impacts outside of health, non-health impacts, economic impacts because of uh, wasted time, for example, related to water collection, inadequate sanitation practices, uh, related to health, again, indirectly health, uh, impacts economy and economy at the different levels, levels of households, communities, uh, and whole countries. And of course, there are economic impacts related to environmental pollution due to wash conditions. There are education, uh, adverse impacts on education, very important area and overlooked, constantly, continuously overlooked gender inequalities around wash. There are safety reasons. This newspaper speaks uh, from, I think it's in Bengali, from West Bengal, just exactly at the time of our household survey in this area, this man was killed by elephant. Was, he was killed during uh, practicing open defecation because of not having access to toilet just, it's not a joke, it's a real situation. So safety concerns are another reason why to focus on WASH. And of course, several environment-related reasons can be mentioned as well. Uh, what is sanitation or env environmental sanitation? Hygienic management of human excreta, primary concern, and ecological management. So. We can, we can illustrate it by this picture of so-called sanitation change. In our uh, countries of interest, usually this first step is which we are focusing on, but more recently we also do some research, we are doing some research on 
the management of excreta, including research on ecological sanitation. There are attempts, programs, projects to, let's say, close the loop, reuse uh, the uh, human excreta by composting and reusing it for in agriculture or for um, bio pline plants. And what we are more specifically focused on is the acceptance. So we are doing household surveys and different kind of uh, research with people to, to find out, figure out whether people would accept to uh, consume, for example, vegetables uh, that are produced based on compost from human excreta. And other questions, interesting questions are also included. Uh, this is a kind of famous diagram called F diagram, schematically showing the fecal oral transmission pathways, how the, how the pathogens can travel from Infect, uh, from infected to new host. So these blue lines indicate so-called primary barrier, toilet barrier that can reduce the transmission of uh, transmission of pathogens uh, on their way to uh, fluid-related transmission, uh, ground-related transmission, flies-related transmission, and hand washing or fingers related transmission. And there are also secondary barriers that are linked to water and hygiene. Of course, the very strong and general recommendation is for, for, for intervention is to address all these three types of barriers, toilets, water, and hygiene together. But the problem is that it's very difficult. And interventions, techniques, how to do it, sometimes differ. So you have a specific type of intervention for addressing toilet problem. You have specific challenges uh, for inter and, and types of interventions related to water, and the same for hygiene. And this is interesting table which compares the power, let me call it power, of these three different components regarding the reduction of risk of diarrhea infections. Sometimes, or very often, people think that water is the most important. Water is the core of everything, but these estimates, based on two systematic reviews, it's a bit dated, 2010, but still illustrative and informative, show that, in fact, uh, consistent hand washing can have more powerful effect for the reduction of risk uh, related to diarrhea than water and then sanitation. Of course, it's a bit tricky because if you want to wash your, wash your hand, you need water. So this number is conditional upon the, upon the availability of water. Again, it's interrelated, but still we are able to estimate and attribute uh, weights to these different components. So it's not only about the water, it's also about the toilets and hygiene. This map uh, is showing some not the most recent, but almost the most recent estimated of the country level shares uh, population with access to safely managed sanitation facilities. If you remember uh, during previous presentation, Honza showed some quality ladder of water services. The same quality ladder can be defined for sanitation and it, it basically provides different quality ladders of sanitation, sanitation technologies started from the absence of any toilets open defecation practice 
uh, and ending at the point of safely managed sanitation systems. And there are exact definitions, much longer than these indicative definitions, what uh, does in different environments safely managed sanitation means. And these estimates should be linked to this quality ladder. And uh, you can see that still, still in many countries, only minority of population have access to safely managed sanitation uh, facilities. There is very important variation, differences both between and within countries. And of course, the most of the sanitation burden is located in Sub-Saharan Africa and then South Asia. Also because of the population size, still India is uh, probably the country of the biggest importance globally regarding inadequate sanitation and need to change the situation. Already mentioned uh, this strategic, global strategic framework. Probably are, are you familiar with this pictures and Millennium Development Goals and Sustainable Development Goals. Maybe the promotion of these goals, quite costly, I can say, is one of the thing that it is good, but there are many goals that will not be achieved. They were very ambitious, have been very ambitious, but uh, from the very beginning, for example, for sanitation in Sustainable Development Goals, it was almost clear that it's not achievable. The goal is ambitious, ambitious to end open defecation, paying special attention to the need of women and girls and those in vulnerable situation. And um, the progress is very slow. And uh, this can be set more generally for most of the targets and goals related to environment. It's not only about the recent crisis like inf inflation and COVID situation, but uh, more generally, I think, environment-related targets are much more challenging, much more difficult to achieve than goals and targets that focus more narrowly on uh, social social aspects of development like I think that it's achievable to for example end almost end poverty if we just measure the poverty as income poverty at some income level but uh, these environment related targets including wash targets are really very uh, challenging and highly unlikely will be met. Uh, if I should say something about sanitation interventions, the most general and important thing is that there are two types, let's say, of techniques uh, that should be combined to, uh, to keep or to, to make the intervention successful. Hardware, it means provision of sanitation infrastructure or subsidies for sanitation infrastructure is one dimension or one direction. And the second one, similarly important, but direction or domain which traditionally have been overlooked is sanitation behavior. Uh, and I should say that in our research we have been more concern, concerned with these behavioral underpinnings of sanitation. Of course, we also measure some parameters of the quality of hardware, basic parameters, but the main focus is on uh, behavioral change. There are various technologies that can be used. Ideally, these technologies should be adjusted uh, with respect to the context. Very often, programs at uh, national level implement uniformly same 
or sim very similar technologies, which is a bit, not a bit, but which is problematic. There are various uh, conceptual frameworks and also regarding techniques and interventions uh, to address behavior, there are different types of uh, interventions or techniques that are somehow theoretically uh, justified. And what is recommended, but, but what uh, very often is not done rigorously in practice before any intervention to analyze local situation and select the most, uh, most appropriate type of behavior change technique as well as the most appropriate type, type of uh, technology that would fit to specific context. This is on paper, but in practice it's not uh, many, often it's not followed. I think there is some problem with ah, no. So we are researchers, our funding uh, has been almost exclusively from uh, resources or grant agencies that require us to publish our research in international journals. So for me as a researcher, the main output is uh, our research papers, but of course we are also concerned about how these findings published in papers can be used in practice. So these are examples of journals in which we published. We started this research on sanitation in 2015, first publication occurred in 2017. It has expanded um, also because of um, collaboration with colleagues abroad, usually in local universities where our primary uh, research surveys are conducted, mostly in India and uh, also collaboration in, with, with Ethiopian universities. I think that I can skip these approaches and other information. Uh, these are our partners, including people in need, but mainly these are Indian and Ethiopian universities. Uh, one picture from, the, from a survey in Ethiopia, one from India. What we do, as I already mentioned, household surveys. Household survey typically means that we have a team of interviewers and they approach uh, people and uh, usually the household, uh, household visit has two components. Firstly, they can do like one hour interview, structured interview, and then they do some basic measurement of sanitation conditions including toilets and their basic parameters based on observations and very basic measurement uh, techniques like for example size of pits, the quality of the technology, uh, whether it's connected, whether it's, whether it's not blocked. So these very, very, very basic measures based on which we are able to somehow quantify the level of standards for each household. Uh, similarly important as household surveys are interviews, semi-structured or focus group discussion with key key actors, policy makers uh, at different levels from the ground level to um, state level. We interviewed, for example, ministers of uh, Jharkhand in India and also middle level district, district level officers. It's, it, it's very important to complement the primary data from household survey with these more policy oriented interviews with other, other agents. Uh, some pictures of our teams in both, I think, India and Ethiopia. You can, see, you can see how they enjoy Ethiopian food. You can see how we enjoyed drinking Indian rice beer. Uh, I think there is some maps where we in past few years conducted our primary data collections. So the most 
time and resources uh, was there spent in India. Uh, and the most interesting for me is, are these two surveys. It's Jharkhand and West Bengal, the border between. I'm, I do not know how familiar are you with Indian states, but Jharkhand and uh, West Bengal are two neighboring, uh, what is it, North, Eastern North Indian states, and this area is still very much tribal area. So large majority of local populations are tribals, which means very interesting um, things with respect to their behavior. For example, they are more situation of gender inequalities are different than in the rest of India. There are some cultural predispositions for better uh, sanitation practices from, from, from the perspective of hygiene and sanitation better. And uh, that's why this, I enjoyed or I found this, uh, particularly this era as the most interesting era for our research. In Ethiopia, these two uh, surveys were done in relation to people in need, but we have also uh, in collaboration with Jima University, a research on what I already mentioned, ecological sanitation. This sanitation uh, loop, reuse of, uh, of, of, of human excreta for agriculture in northern part of Ethiopia. Unfortunately, because of, sci uh, because of war in Ethiopia, uh, it has been quite affected, but still we in collaboration with local colleagues, we were able to collect the data during the war as well. Fische, Romia. Oh. So probably you cannot see properly the toilets, but Indian type of toilets are in the bottom part and Ethiopian toilets are in the upper part. So at the first side, you can recognize the difference. Standards of Ethiopian toilets are very low. These are sometimes very rudimentary pit latrines or even just pits without any superstructure. Indian toilets are very different and very also uniform because um, India focuses, Indian interventions usually focuses on provision of toilets and they provide quite uniform technologies. So, of course, there are huge uh, variations in the quality of these toilets, but the typologically, typologically they are very similar. So I can return to this scheme. Why these two countries were selected? It was not only because uh, I like India and our friends from people in need working in Ethiopia, but it can be justified uh, also because of very uh, different approaches, policies used by these two countries for addressing sanitation. As I already mentioned, in India, uh, they traditionally, not only the last, uh, sanitation program which we evaluate but also previous sanitation scheme very heavily focused on the provision of toilet on hardware but neglected the behavior by contrast in Ethiopia it was opposite also because of budgetary constraint but not only also because of lobbying from Western experts to Ethiopian governments. Their uh, national sanitation strategy used something which is called community-led total sanitation, which is uh, promotion of sanitation using solely behavior change uh, techniques without addressing, without addressing infrastructure, without providing any subsidies or any improved components to people. So these two countries basically have uh, 
gone along different trajectories from situations where there were very little sanitation facilities, almost no toilets, no, no toilets particularly in rural areas. Uh, Ethiopian situation changed towards a situation that can be described as <coughs> environment where there are almost all households or significant majority of households have some sanitation facility and they also use uh, these facilities quite consistently but as I already indicated these toilets are very poor quality so maybe more dangerous than before when they practiced open defecation dispersed in different parts of environment now these pathogens are concentrated in uh, bad quality sanitation facilities. In India, uh, because of these government programs mainly, not only, but mainly, uh, there are toilets, but very often unused, because the focus has been traditionally on the provision of infrastructure without adequately addressing behavior change. Uh, so how much time do we have? So these are going to be a few specific examples of topics we are researching. As I already said, uh, we do primary research, research based on field, field research, field data collection, but we also work with secondary data. What we do is uh, reviews, systematic reviews and analysis of secondary data and we are trying to promote or to follow what we call a geographical approach. Geographical approach can be contrasted to what is called medical or epidemiological approach. Uh, and if I can simply define what I mean by a geographical approach, the approach that puts attention to the context, contextual variations. Medical approach, epidemiological approach, first of all concentrates on the examination of effects of interventions. Most, most importantly using some experimental techniques, you may be familiar with acronyms like RCTS, randomized control trials, if not it doesn't matter. So they take uh, they take approaches, methodologies from health sciences and apply them to environmental sciences where uh, these methods, in my opinion, do not work well by primarily focusing on the effects of interventions, trying to quantify whether an intervention has 20% effect regarding the improvement in main outcome, outcomes or mm, different effects but they systematically neglect other important question including uh, understanding to the mechanism how the intervention work what is the theory behind the measured effect which factors influence intervention and what other factors uh, influence sanitation independently or along the intervention so we particularly focus on this fourth question studying factors that can influence sanitation as such. This is one of the outputs from our systematic review. Usual common systematic review following which I called medical approach. Try to systematically uh, look at what the effects of intervention are. We dig into the literature and try to understand what factors influence what sanitation outcomes. One of the outputs, because it's complex, we use, for example, network analysis, network visualization to um, make or enable better understanding of the relationship between types of factors and specific sanitation outcomes. 
maybe I would need more time to, to, to explain, but basically when a practitioner look at it, he can, and it's behind this plot there is a database, he can figure out what factors are probably the most important for, for example, outcomes related to use of latrines, what factors are the most important regarding the disuse of latrines and other types of outcomes. So we try to systematically review other uh, components of research studies than uh, the focus of medical literature is. We do some secondary data analysis. This is uh, the district level analysis from India, trying to figure out the determinants of uh, correlates of sanitation conditions in India. Um, again, I would need more time to explain what does it mean and what uh, the findings are. Uh, one, but let me mention one interesting example. Uh, in many studies, in fact, in majority of studies that uh, have uh, looked at how religious affiliation affect wash, including sanitation, Muslim population uh, usually um, reveals better, better sanitation practices and more generally better wash situation. The explanation usually is that Islam and Muslims are more inclined towards hygienic behaviors than other, other religions, particularly in India, Hinduism. Uh, but we, when we analyzed these district level variations, uh, this is the map for the importance of share of Muslims in district level population, we found out that the common explanation is true, but that it holds only for some parts and some Muslim communities in India. In other contexts in India, where there are, for example, in migrating Muslim communities, uh, the results uh, didn't support the common hypothesis about the superiority, I would say, of Muslims with respect to sanitation behavior. So this is one of specific interesting finding in my opinion. And in India, we mainly focused uh, on the major, the biggest ever sanitation program called Swaj Bharat Mission. Can we translate it as a mission of clean India? Basically, this program in the period between 2014 to 2019 had ambitions to provide toilets for all Indian households. India is big, more than one billion of population. So it's a big scheme, obviously. And in Jharkhand, we analyzed we, we, we conducted baseline survey, we analyzed the situation before the intervention, before the program starts, and we then analyzed in 2019 the end line situation. And this is uh, one slide from the baseline survey when we examined the conditions, sanitation conditions, and the factors influencing the conditions. We found out that at that time, uh, variation between households in the excess and use of toilets can be explained mainly on structural factors. It means it's related to inequalities in education, income, and these traditional predictors. But that there is a little variation in psych psychological uh, mechanism influencing preferences toward, towards improvement in future. So despite structural inequalities, uh, behavioral preferences uh, were quite similar. What happened during the implementation of the SBM? This is from the end line survey and this plot compares in blue baseline situation and end line situation for different parameters starting from toilet coverage, so you can see that the provision of toilets was quite significant. Less than 20% 20 of households uh, had 
sanitation facilities before, but almost 90% after. So it was quite successful, quite important change in sanitation conditions in this uh, area which we studied in different parts of India. It may be different and it was different. But we also find that uh, the knowledge about hygiene and sanitation remained almost unchanged as a result of, again, um, neglect of education and behavioral change component of this intervention. One slide related to our research into gender inequalities and the role of uh, women in Indian sanitation. What we analyzed in Jharkhand, same study area, uh, was uh, how SBM, Swaj Bharat Mission, that big scheme, influenced the situation of rural women. Uh, before the analysis, we reviewed literature and identified two, let's say, is it point there? Two narratives where in, for example, this is Prime Minister of India Narendra Modi uh, justifying the implementation of this program by saying I'm suffering when mothers and daughters have to go for open defecation. So women and girls discursively have been constructed as the main beneficiaries for this intervention. And it can be disaggregated, this narrative can be disaggregated to one of the, maybe the main sub, let's say sub-narrative uh, focused on the need to fulfill their sex-specific push needs. It's obvious that men and women have different sex-related needs when it comes to sanitation and water. In India, water and sanitation are very, very integrated unlike in Sub-Saharan Africa. And the second was uh, fulfillment of uh, practical gender needs uh, related to water collection. Usually the burden, work, work burden around water collection and sanitation facilities cleaning is on women, including in Jharkhand. So the narrative was to change this. But how? Um, I, I will say something on findings later. The second narrative, uh, women as sanitation agents, also present that uh, women would be the main change agents, implementers of, of the change in sanitation. So all these four, narr four, four narratives uh, were identified in strategic documents, in policy speeches, and we analyzed whether it is reflected in the impacts on the ground. So what we found is that, in fact, the provision of toilets in Jharkhand uh, impacted on sex-specific practical needs, but mostly negatively, because most of these toilets were not connected to piped water. The burden related to cleaning and uh, water collection increased for many rural women due to, because of this intervention. So contradictory to the promises, uh, it affected negatively local women. We also found that there was very strong role of women in as, as, as change agents. The most of the work at ground level with respect to the implementation of this intervention was done by women. Each community had two or three representatives, always females, working on organization of the work, sometimes working even in the co on the construction of toilets, uh, but they were very poorly compensated, almost no salaries, unlike for men who monitored, who did some monitoring and were paid for it. These uh, female representatives of communities were very poorly paid, so it may be called like instrumentalization, use and misuse of women uh, for this intervention. Again, negative finding, some fi something that should be criticized. Paradoxically, there is a paradox, which we also find that 
it increased in empowering them in some sense. It increased their social status within communities and also the decision making a role within households. So this negative effect have also or had also some positive side, but it's a kind of by byproduct coincidental with and not expected from the beginning. So we really found that the gender inequality and the domain of this, these issues is very, very important for sanitation, particularly in this tribal rural area in Jharkhand. I have some slides from Ethiopia as well. I already mentioned very poor quality of toilets and we did some research on social norms, perception of social approval or disapproval of others regarding sanitation behavior of, uh, of uh, respondents. And I can just mention this metaphor that we used for the interpretation of our results. The situation in Ethiopia, also because of PIN projects, <laughs> I can say, can be described as a social and political construction of latrines. When physical construction was quite poor in terms of the hygienic standards of sanitation facilities, but there was huge social and political pressures on people to use these, to construct by themselves and use these rudimentary toilets. Most likely there is no study on health impacts. It's very difficult to measure health impacts of sanitation in short time span. But most likely these interventions uh, ended up with situation that is more risky for human health than the situation before from my point of so, so the metaphor of social and political construction describes somehow the uh, ground level situation. We also did, as I mentioned, some work on the psychosocial mechanisms, uh, trying, to, trying to understand how uh, social norms around sanitation work. And just let me mention again one metaphor or one concept. Where is it? Emotional satisfaction. So we identified that because of, which I mentioned, social and political construction of latrines, because of these pressures, uh, people were in fact emotionally satisfied. It means satisfaction with their toilets, irrespectively, uh, irrespectively of the quality of these toilets. So any toilets based were perceived as important and good for their health, despite uh, not having any evidence about these positive effects because of the pressures constructed during the uh, implementation of the strategy. I think uh, we also analyzed the willingness to pay. This is common, common focus of this research is trying to analyze whether local people are affordable enough to improve their not only sanitation facilities but also access to water and other other wash uh, parameters uh, fine we figured out that the willingness to pay is very low uh, that is probably uh, not not, not probably that, that sure that uh, there is not enough resources in local households to uh, buy so market based market based uh, strategies are not usable in this context because people do not have resources to buy this is kind of solid slab platform a basic component of hygienic latrine but in addition to this uh, to this Unaffordability, we also identified some subjective barriers related to inadequate conception of people what hygienic <coughs> toilet is. To mention at least one specific uh, example of this inadequate conception or preferences is that 
when we asked systematically respondents about what is the most important component of toilets, they very rarely mentioned that these slabs that can uh, reduce the contact between, effectively reduce the contact between excreta and human person in question. They rarely mention this, but they usually mention the roof of the toilets because of rainy season. And it's, it's, it's in fact difficult to use toilets in rainy season when there is no roof. But uh, from the point of health effects, uh, slabs are the primary, primary and the most important component. I can provide more examples, but this is concluding uh, slide, and maybe I will not read this, but at least mention this idea of interventional trap. As researchers working both with practitioners and policymakers, and working with academic literature, I repeatedly uh, see that many particularly practitioners, I'm happy that Honza is already away, uh, are a little bit narrowed in their understanding of uh, sanitation and other wash phenomena, assuming that everything can be changed through specific interventions, which is really a nonsense uh, in my, from my point of view. Uh, interventions can be useful, can facilitate the situation, can trigger some change, but without more general development changes, without improving education, without improving incomes, without improving access to infrastructure, which is beyond the capacity of particular individuals and communities, uh, interventions, projects, and even programs, which specifically focus on sanitation as well as to other domains, uh, will not be effective. And in fact, what the literature says about sanitation interventions, not only in the global south, but also in global north, is that this domain, sanitation, is uh, the domain where the interventions very often fail. The highest failure rate compared to other types of developmental interventions can be uh, found uh, in for sanitation interventions. So this is pessimistic conclusion, uh, but this is my academic research perspective on, on the topic. Thank you, and sorry for using more time, probably. Thank you very much. So this is a fellow, uh, and now it's time for your questions. Well, I have a question. Uh, do you, do you, uh, most of the data were collected several years back. Uh, are, you, are you making research recently? It's not in some other countries. Uh, yeah. Comparing the India, Ethiopia, and some other country, maybe. Yeah, not only the most of the data that I uh, presented here are a bit dated, but also the presentation itself is a bit dated. So I, I'm sorry, but I didn't prepare anything purposively for, for, for this session. Uh, of course, we have ongoing research, as I mentioned, on ecological sanitation in Ethiopia. This is ongoing. I have data in my computer, not processed, not uh, examined, so I don't know what the acceptance of local people in North Ethiopia regarding ecological sanitation is. It's waiting for our analysis. We have data from Cambodia. One of my PhD students conducted some research in Cambodia. We did uh, some research in uh, other parts of India, but not in one of our, my PhD students in Odisha. And, uh, now, currently, because sanitation is only one of my research areas, another major domain is urban expansion. We use satellite images uh, analyzing how major cities in global south, including India, are expanding. And we now have project under review which plans to integrate sanitation and urban expansion. 
So we would like to look how this very quickly growing Indian cities, densifying, also densifying rural areas regarding built up land, densifying, uh, influence sanitation conditions. So we have some preliminary data, but not, not processed, not published. Uh, you probably say, but uh, you say that uh, Muslim have uh, better hygienic behavior. Uh, yeah. Who was in opposite, uh, Buddhist or uh, Christian? Yeah. Or, yeah, yeah. And uh, did you compare uh, this data set with uh, other country? Where is the Muslim population mm -hmm. and other? There are some there are some papers. This is something which is pr maybe given or maybe very clear from the literature that in different countries of global south, Muslim communities, on average, tend to have higher sanitation and wash and hygiene rates than other communities. It's there are literature from Sub-Saharan Africa. There are literature from Southeast Asia. There are literature from India. Even the comparison of Bangladesh in India. Bangladesh is uh, economically at much lower level than India, but regarding sanitation and the wash in general, it's much higher, much better sanitation indicators, uh, both access to toilets and uh, use of toilets can be found in Bangladesh. Uh, the, there are many different factors that can be used for the explanation of this difference between Bangladesh and India, but religion is one of the most apparent. In our research, Jharkhand context, there are one part of the sample were Muslim families, another major part were Sarna families. I'm not sure whether you know the term Sarna, it's tribal religion, and then we have Hindu, Hindu families. So both Sarna and Hindu families were lower in terms of both uh, sanitation rates and preferences than Muslim families, but it's again a bit tricky. One factor that can make this to be a kind of false correlation is that Muslim families uh, in this area have had much more intensive migration history. Many of these families work in, or relatives or their members work in the Gulf countries or in Singapore, Thailand, and these links and experiences from abroad make them both richer, I mean Muslim families in this area, and uh, more, let's say, modern, including uh, sanitation practices. Uh, so it's not only about religion as such, but other factors can influence the differences as well. But it's, it's established that on, on average Muslims are better <laughs> in this respect. So do the local governments or organizations have access to this research or similar research and do they yeah. uh, implement this in their projects? You mean in India or in Ethiopia? In both countries. In both countries, yeah. So as I said, we are funded from, from like academic uh, types of funding and the main outputs, we, what we are required is to publish. Um, we organize seminars uh, with local decision makers regularly, so we interact with them. And the most importantly, I understand my contribution not only through our published research, but for all of these researches, what is a must is to collaborate with local people. So I have, for example, PhD students from these localities here in Prague, from each of them. We have local partners, so there is a transmission of experience and knowledge in this sense. And to mention, to mention, to mention two concrete examples of how our findings 
let's say, changed a little bit the situation. At the beginning, I said that we focus at program and policy level, and it's not only about one or two papers published by our group, but uh, regarding this critique of uh, situation in Ethiopia, there are like 15 publications from different teams, gradually mushrooming. And uh, they stopped the program. Because of this pressure, they stop the, stopped the use of this CLTS approach in Ethiopia and trying to find out other interventions that would be more effective, focusing particularly on uh, how to upgrade the quality of toilets. So this is changed. And in India, the same. One of our finding, major findings in our research was that when we analyzed social norms, there are two types of social norms, descriptive social norms, particular, basically descriptive social norms work. It's about learning. When people see the change around, around their household, that other people starting to use toilets, they are more inclined naturally to use toilets. So this is descriptive social norm. Norm is being established that sanitation, improved sanitation is, is normal. But there are also second type of social norms which are injunctive social norms. And these social norms are these pressures, maybe politically, political coercion, physical coercion, maybe in Ethiopia we saw that some people could be, could go to prison if they didn't have, didn't construct their toilet. Uh, and an influential way how to create, establish this injunctive norm is shaming people. In India, we, we, one of our findings was that this negative, negative, injunctive norm created using so-called name and shame techniques can have adverse effect on sustainability of the behavioral change. And again, this finding, in this case I may say that we were the first, but in other papers uh, they, they uh, supported this view. So at least on paper, Indian government decided to forbid this naming and shaming techniques uh, in implementation of this Swaj Bharat mission. On paper, in practice, because it's easier for implementers to shame people and create these negative pressures, it's still used, but officially it's forbidden based on the research findings. Not only ours, but also other findings. So there is some, it's complicated, but there is some transmission of research findings to practice at program level and policy level. So thank you. That was it. You have to Charles Thank you. <laughs>